bitch ass nigga. I noticed one of my students mouthing something to a student outside the door. When I caught on, the student in the seat averted his eyes. The student outside the door stared at me. I said, my man, figure out a place to go. He quipped, what? I repeated myself. He said, make me leave. <laughs> ah, ah, see, I had promised myself this year not to enforce school rules while in the halls. I told myself, entre les murs, between the walls of my classroom only. Me, the guy known for high expectations in business suits, would demure in the corridors, yes. For years, I wore a business suit every day except dress down Fridays. Unless you have administrative support, do not address student behavior in the corridors. I'm telling you, it only leads to frustration on your part and a perpetuation of their behavior. Students have stood outside our doors, cursing, smoking marijuana, poking their heads in classrooms, and when we call security, they run, only to come back later. Futile. On that day, however, I couldn't resist. I mean, this kid was technically in the hall, but at my door. I walked to the threshold, looked him square in the eye. Figure out some place to go. That typically works. He stood about a third of an inch taller than me, dark caramel in complexion, curly hair, face adorned with scattered patches of beard and mustache growth weight. He's a man. In the book, Blackboard Jungle, Evan Hunter wrote about this. He said their bodies were mature, strong bodies, and they thought in their own twisted manner, the way adults think. And it was extremely difficult to consider them kids when a good many of them outreach you and outweighed you and sometimes outthought you. The temptation to clobber was always there. And it was sometimes more difficult not to strike than it would have been to strike and the consequences be damned. Why do I put up with it all? My work has become less and less appealing throughout the years. Every aspect of my work is under a microscope. What to teach, how to teach, how to grade, who to pass, how many to pass, how to test, how often to test, how often to test. In many schools, teachers are intimidated and or simply undermined. For instance, in one school where I taught, if you failed seniors, the principal simply changed their grades. Then you have to watch these students fist pump as they walk across the stage during graduation and sit through staff meetings where the principal brags about, guess what? Mm -hmm. Increase graduation rates. Oh, and for students chronically absent? So, what could you do differently to motivate them to come to school? <laughs> oh, I'm responsible for students getting to school? What about APEC? You know, the American public education complex, the many factors that contribute to the overall educational health of students, like quality of the Board of Education? Class size, the community, curriculum, the economy, federal government initiatives, a governor's vision for public education, budget, parents, politics, poverty, English language acquisition, um, crime rates, effectiveness of the principal, um, race, socioeconomic status, a state government's vision for public education, budget, Zip code, the student, superintendent objectives, um, teacher education programs, teachers, or how about the degree to which menstrual equity is acknowledged and attained? Whether classrooms have working air conditioning or central heating, whether the bathroom stalls have doors, yes, that's a thing. The list goes on, focus only on the teacher. Some Stanford economist said the reason he limits his research to teachers and, for example, not families is because our government will not allow families to be the subject of study in this country. Yeah. He said, we're hesitant to intervene on what goes on in the household and the family, and so I emphasize schools because that's what I can intervene with. That's a public policy instrument. That explains it. I'm not suggesting that families should now be targeted. It's just interesting how Concentrating on schools becomes hyper-focusing on teachers, and this absorption with one aspect of the American public education complex obscures the complexity of student success or failure. So, 
If one kid gets clobbered, would it make it any easier for us teachers? Or would I just be the sorry looking bully teacher caught on some hall walker's camera phone, shamed on nightly news? Don't I even comprehend that in this moment, this student and I are about to engage in an aggressive act that sociologically has little to do with either of us? Who has time to intellectualize? Look, this boy may have problems, but so do I. My daddy was absent too. Let's go. This may be my way out of teaching. I once heard of a concept called suicidal homicide or something like suicide by homicide, where people won't actually kill themselves, but they'll shoot at cops. A decision that inevitably leads to their demise. Because deep down, they want to die. Perhaps because I feel so demeaned, demoralized, and devalued by the audacity of this student or the American public education complex that birthed him, I would risk my career as a teacher. <clears throat> Let me be clear. I cannot give up on my students. But were I fired? At that moment, his teacher interposed with her body. Facing the student, arms outstretched. Walk with me. After his profanity-laced perhoration, he walked with her. However, his disrespect had residual effects. It lingered in the eyes of my students and in the now quieted corridor. I had to ask, what's that student's name? The student turned around, vigorously marching back in my direction. You want my name? You want my name? The students lingered to see the action. As he approached, you want to know my name? I traced an imaginary line and looking off to nothing in particular said, don't touch me. All I'm saying, touch a brother, it's going to be different. I code switch. It's a defensive protective gesture. See, when I speak in a professional dialect, I'm dismissed by some students as being weak. However, when I slide into my other vernacular, I resonate. And being so perceived, I might could just kick somebody's ass. The teachers parked in professional parlance, where I've taught, let's just say, when the going gets tough. On other occasions when dealing with belligerent students in the corridors while wearing a business suit and necktie, I've said, don't be confused by the tie, bruh. Translation, I'm playing the role as teacher, but I'm really you. In French, the term for business suit is costume de faire. See, if they buy into the idea that I am them, then I am not someone in this plastic school world where boys with underdeveloped muscles and identities can simulate a man being something less than a man. If they know I am them, then there will be no physical altercation. So interestingly, code switching protects them. And it was Friday, so I was dressed down, which I'm sure contributed to the credibility. Had I been wearing my costume, one couldn't predict le dénouement. He took one step backward and kept raising his voice until school security came. I took another route to the main office on the first floor. But before I reached the front office, whom did I meet? That same student, unescorted. And he said, in ye, a bitch ass nickel. What you gonna do now, bitch ass nickel? Seemingly baptizing me in bitch ass niggerness. He was so loud, the school police were roused and came into the hall to quell the student. Because now that he disturbed someone on the first floor, he would most assuredly be dealt with. Later, the assistant principal droned that the student was a repeater and should be in night school because he's too old and is failing just about everything. This is not the place for him. Not once did the student have to reconcile his words or behavior with me, the students in my class, or those with an earshot of his impudence. I mean, did anyone tell him or any of the other students that I was not a bitch ass nigga? That I defend the vulnerable and fatherless? That I'm a present committed loving father? That even though African American males make up about 2% of the teaching force in the United States and even when others have left, I've stayed? So, I mean, no one's told him that I'm an honorably discharged veteran of the United States Air Force. So he doesn't know about the other student who came to the same door and ended up in a hospital for a week? Yeah, this student approached me and patiently waited for me to finish a conversation and crying said, 
I'm having thoughts. The student has specific thoughts and plans to end her life that day. She was terrified. So he's not aware that after the hospital stay, that particular student emerged, better able to navigate life, and as of my last check-in, reports enjoying her life. No one's cleared any of this up for him. Well then, I guess I remain an undisputed bitch-ass nigga. According to UrbanDictionary.com, a bitch-ass nigga is a brother that acts like a sister, always whining and talking too much, taking your stuff, talking behind your back. Have I become a B-A-N? Seriously, have I become one who takes the stuff dished out to me as a teacher? Because each day I take the stuff, talk behind their backs in the teacher's lounge or to my colleagues, I may very well fit the description. But you know, as upsetting as it was, I don't fully blame the student. Nah, it's more complex than that. I blame this constructed school culture. I blame a republic that allows politicians to tinker with the long-term potential of public education during limited terms. I blame America's caste system and wealth inequality that contribute to the conflict. I blame an education system that overemphasizes college when less than 40% of our adult population possess a four-year degree. I blame a compulsory education system that mandates curricula, which at times inspires antipathy to my craft, hostility to this otherwise beautiful process of learning. I blame ideologies and, and policies that coddle this boy and creeds and codes of conduct that groom children for America's prison industrial complex. That young man is a product of our society. If I'm indeed a bitch ass nigga, I can't shoot the messenger. And to be fair, especially to those considering the profession, the incident was only one interaction with one student of approximately 3,000 students that I've taught, which by the way, took place on only one day of about 3,000 days that I've spent as a public school teacher. About three ten thousandths of my experience. But who cares about my experience? Teacher appreciation. <coughs> One of the most patronized professions. Lots of public praise, but practically and privately? I mean, I don't want to seem ungrateful, but in mature relationships, don't you state your wants and needs? <clears throat> public praise, cups, pens, and t-shirts? is not my professional appreciation language. Now, students and parents keep the considerate notes and gift cards coming. Personally, I like you know, most restaurants and coffee and chocolate and caramels, the little ones, the ones that are soft. I like those a lot, but I digress. May I suggest two administrators, board members, policy makers, and ed educational executives Try substituting the platitudes of appreciation with better say and better pay. I don't say every kiss begins with pay, but not all educators feel appreciated in the same way. And let's be honest, who's really listening to us when it comes to what's best for students? What teachers know is marginalized and subjugated. French philosopher Michel Foucault said the following, I believe that by subjugated knowledge is one should understand something else, something which in a sense is altogether different. Namely, a whole set of knowledges that have been disqualified as inadequate to their task or insufficiently elaborated. Naive knowledges, located low down on the hierarchy, beneath the required level of cognition or scientificity. It is through the reemergence of these low ranking knowledges, these unqualified, even directly disqualified knowledges, popular knowledge. Le savoir des gens. It is through the reappearance of these knowledges that criticism performs its work. As it regards my craft, my knowledge is customarily disqualified. Even though, or probably because teachers understand APEC better than most, our voices are, on the whole, ultimately depreciated. Even though we know how to make it relevant and fun. No, here's a test. It will increase uh, other test scores. The teachers and the students are test-weary. Um, we need to increase graduation rates. 
the students are uninspired. Try this new initiative. This resembles the last new initiative that you're simply resisting change. Frederick Douglass famously said, power concedes nothing without a demand it never did and it never will. From that same 1857 speech, Douglass went on to say, find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue so they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Douglas said words or blows. Foucault said the agent that could transform one system of knowledge and power into another was thought and critique. Foucault and Douglas understood the power of critique that must come from us who possess marginalized knowledges. Let's have Bois de Jean, the knowledge of the people. Comrades, Cornel West said, to niggerize a people is to make them afraid and ashamed and scared and intimidated, so they are deferential to the powers that be. Mm -mm. It's time for a reemergence of our voice, a reappearance of our agency. If our voices can't be heard regarding what goes on between the walls of the classroom, virtual or otherwise, then who's? In the classroom, don't be custodians of capitalism, mediators of methodologies which don't pass professional muster, much less with your students, consenters of cultures which don't cultivate pro-social norms, agents of assessments detached from the essence of what they've learned, dispatchers of discipline which distances one from the whole, runners for faux reformers who spent this much time in the classroom, Couriers of curricula, counter to curiosity, intermediaries of folks, ignorant of the whole child, ambassadors of anything which alienates students from the joy of learning. You actually have a relationship with them and are proximate to their potential. You actually understand their journeys. Well, not apprehending every step, but daily you see hope and future in and through their eyes because this agency reappeared, this voice reemerged, is symbiotically yours and theirs. Or maybe. There is truth to what the student said to me, the epitome of us, so you. Are you a BAN? If so, unban yourself. All teachers need to be de so we can do what we know how to do best, teach.